Council people called the Surrender Ground. This is one of the last regions here in Virginia, east of the Blue Ridge, to be settled. But the folks who do come here, the question they've got on their mind is, can you raise the buyer? And they found out you can. We grow some of the best dark fire tobacco anywhere in the world, right here in Alabama County. But they also found out you can grow just about everything you need here for both human and animal populations. Uh, this is an ideal area for family farming, but because of the institution of slavery, it is also an ideal area for plantation style agriculture, and that's what we have is a mixture of the two, and slavery is important to both. Uh, prior to the Civil War, over half the population of this county are slaves. comes to this area, he's looking for a site to build a stage stop. This is about one day's journey from Lynchburg. And so he buys 200 acres of land right here from one of the local plantations called Clover Hill. And he built that tavern as his stage stop. He also built a guest house, a kitchen, and slave quarters. And those four buildings are the beginnings of this little town. Now, people call this place Patterson's Tavern for a while, but it becomes known as Clover Hill Tavern and then Clover Hill Village. But the village really didn't develop until after 1845, because on May the 1st of 1845, Appomattox was officially declared a new county. And this little village of Clover Hill is selected to be the county seat. And they come here, they build, the first thing they build is a jail. And that jail was over there in the corner, it's no longer uh, with us. But then they built a courthouse building, and then they changed the name of the town. We become the village of Appomattox Courthouse, which is consistent with how we name county seats here in Virginia. Uh, the name of the county plus two words, courthouse. So when you see courthouse, two separate words, it is a town. You see courthouse, one word, it's built. Lee Grant never set foot in the building, but they did do it twice uh, in the town. Now, folks, when you build a courthouse, lawyers are going to come to town. It's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and so lawyers came, and they began to uh, build uh, law offices. Some of them built homes, the nice white house on the other side of the courthouse out there in the field, built by a family of lawyers. Their name was Bocot. They furnished some of the first county officials. Thomas Bocock was the first Commonwealth attorney. His daddy and his brother were the first two clerks of the court. Uh, Thomas went on to become a United States Congressman, and he served for 13 years prior to the Civil War. He's heavily involved in the politics that led up uh, to the war itself. He's not a secessionist, but when Virginia did leave the Union, Thomas Bocock resigned came home and went to Richmond as a Confederate Congressman. And Thomas Pocock was the first and only Speaker of the House of the Confederate Congress. He was a powerful man before and during the war. The Pocock family moved on uh, before the war, uh, sold that home, uh, it eventually becomes property of Louis Isbell, and, and Louis Isbell is the Commonwealth Attorney in 1865. The blue-gray house in the distance, is the home of George Pierce in 1865. He is the uh, clerk of the court. If you have time today, walk that road down past that house. Last shots fired by Lee's army were in the front yard of that house. Now you're going to 
see some displays down there to tell you about that and tell you about some other things that are, I think you'll find is great uh, interest. Now, this old tavern changed hands a few times uh, before the war. Uh, the uh, Patterson uh, family sold it to uh, a gentleman named Dearman. Dearman was a local land speculator. He was heavily invested in this village, hoping to make a fortune. That never happened. Oh, excuse me, he buys it after the Rainey family. The Rainey family came here first and bought it. Uh, they were pretty well to do when they came here, but they had a lot of misfortunes, both economically and health-wise. They lost several members of the family to disease. Uh, they sold the tavern uh, to McNear. Uh, but uh, interestingly enough, once they sold that tavern, they went over here across the street and they built a brand new tavern and went into competition with and then shortly after they built the tavern, they built that nice brick house. And that was a guest house for the rainy tavern. But in spite of that, this little village is very prosperous. Uh, folks are doing well. And in the uh, early 50, 1850s, the uh, rumor got started a railroad was going to come. And they're hoping it's coming right here. But if you look around you, you'll see why it did not. But if you go up that road about three miles, you'll come to a ridge line that divides two major watersheds. Chesapeake Bay is in this direction. Southern River is on the other side. They go through the off ball Sound, North Carolina. And that ridge line is a great place to go on the river. That's what they did. Southside Railroad connected Lynchburg to Petersburg. They put a little siding out here. They called it Appomattox Station. And from the moment that railroad began to operate, this village began to die. The first thing to go was stagecoaches. Then taverns began to suffer. Rainy family, that was kind of the nail in the coffin. They put their property up for sale and left town. Uh, you may have noticed that nice monument out there in the field. Uh, that is the Rainy family cemetery. Uh, the property didn't sell very quickly. In fact, it was not until after the war started. 1862, a gentleman out of Northern Virginia came here and bought that tavern property. He did not want the tavern, but he did want that nice brick guest house. And in 1863, he brought his family here, and they made that their home, and his name was Roman McClain. Now, people who come here today ask us very often, you know, why would Robert E. Lee come here? Uh, he never intended to, folks. Uh, he was forced here. And if you're interested in uh, that story, come on with me. We're going to go over here where you can sit down, look at the battlefield, and we'll talk about why Lee brought his army here. He's finishing up his first term of office. He's making plans to run for re-election in the fall. He really does want to serve that second term. He wants to see this war come to an end with a Union victory. He wants to see this nation reunited. But Abraham Lincoln is going to lose the election in the fall of 1864 unless something about the war changes. People in the North are sick of the war. You've probably heard the expression, a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. And that's where it started. It started in the Civil, during the Civil War and it started in the North, but it was used by both sides. Now, I don't want to destroy any illusions that you folks might have about politicians. <laughs> but there have been instances in the history of this country where political considerations influenced military decisions. I don't know if you knew that or not. But Abraham Lincoln is no exception. He made several decisions during the spring and summer of 64 that are designed to manipulate the war and improve his odds of getting reelected. Now one of the decisions he made is he brought a gentleman by the name of Ulysses S. Grant to Virginia and he put him in charge of all the Union armies. And that was not a popular decision in some circles. Uh, people said, President Lincoln, that man drinks. And Lincoln said, find out what that man drinks and let's give some to the rest of my generals. That man fights. That man will do the terrible arithmetic. And Grant did bring a different philosophy 
Grant knew the war would not end or be won by, by the North just by taking Richmond. He knew the only way the North could win the American Civil War is to destroy Confederate armies. And so that's what he sets about to do. Uh, when you hear about the exploits of that gentleman by the name of Sherman down in Georgia, and you hear about Siegel, Hunter, Sheridan in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, the Red River Campaign, Louisiana, all of these things are being coordinated by Grant and Lincoln with the intent of destroying Confederate armies. Make them fight. Keep them separated. And if you can't beat them on the battlefield, you destroy their supplies, their supply lines, and you take the war to the civilian population to destroy morale and support. It's called total war. Now, General Grant uh, affiliated himself with the Union Army of the Potomac. That's George Meade's army. And that's the army that's dealing with Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, around the 1st of May, 1864, Grant crossed the Rapidan River and began what's called the Overland Campaign. Battle of the Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, North Anna River, Cotopotomy Creek, and then a little place called Cold Harbor, just outside of Richmond. Now, no one knows who won most of those fights. There were no real winners. But win or lose, Grant did something that no commander here in Virginia before him had done. He kept coming. He kept moving and making Robert E. Lee defend and fight. Now, when Grant did come to Virginia, they called him Unconditional Surrender Grant. When he got to Cold Harbor, he had a new nickname. They called him The Butcher. He lost close to 70,000 men in a little over two months. He lost 6,000 men in less than one hour at Cold Harbor. They found Grant in his tent uh, on at least one occasion weeping over the casualties over some of the decisions that he had made. And I tell you that because I want you to know Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant, neither one of them was the devil and neither one of them was God. They were generals, they had to make tough decisions, and almost every time they made a decision, men were going to die. And I think that weighed heavily on both of them during the war. But it's at Cold Harbor, one of Lee's greatest victories, one of Grant's worst defeats, that General Lee gathered his staff and he told them, he said, if we don't destroy Grant here and now, before he crosses the James River, this thing will become a siege, and then it's just a matter of time. And sure enough, less than two weeks, Grant crossed the James and he attacked Petersburg. And that leads to a siege that's going to last almost ten months. Now, it is during the siege of Petersburg and Richmond that Sherman took Atlanta. And Jubal Early was defeated by Sheridan in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia and the South lost the breadbasket of the Confederacy. And those two events basically gave Abraham Lincoln the change in the war he needed to get reelected. And with the re-election of Lincoln, all hope that the South has to end the war with a negotiated peace agreement of some type is gone. Lincoln will not back down on two issues, secession and slavery, and neither will the South. So now it's going to be decided on the battlefield. It was the 1st of April, 1865. Union forces got around Robert E. Lee's right flank near Petersburg, a place called Five Forks. The next day, Grant ordered an all-out assault from Richmond to Petersburg, 37 miles of trenches and earthworks and the breakthrough occurred. And Robert E. Lee realized he could no longer uh, hold those two cities. So he orders an evacuation. His plan, <clears throat> regather his army at Amelia Courthouse, which is a stop on the Richmond Danville Railroad. He orders trains with food supplies to be waiting for him at Amelia Courthouse. He wants to get his army there, feed them, let them rest for a short time, and then they're going to march down that railroad through Danville into North Carolina. Lee believes if he could combine his army of Northern Virginia with Joe Johnston's Confederate Army of the Tennessee, that those two major Confederate armies combined 
can whip that gentleman named Sherman, who had finished up in Georgia, South Carolina, and was now in North Carolina. And once they took care of Sherman, they were coming back to Virginia to deal with Grant. But it's been a pretty tough winter and spring. Uh, the roads are terrible shape, buddy. Creeks are flooded, bridges have washed out, and Lee's army gets strung out. And they don't get to Amelia Courthouse in a timely fashion. Uh, so this is where Lee makes a critical decision. He decides to spend an extra day at Amelia Courthouse to let the stragglers catch up and to let men forage for food because once they got there they soon realized there's everything but food on those trains. And that delay cost Lee dear. Uh, it allowed federal forces to get around him again and block his route at Jetersville. So the next day, rather than fight, Lee decides to head west. And his goal is to get to the town of Farmville, 30 miles south of us. There's food there. There's food on trains at nearby Rice's Station. But it's the same plan. Get them to Farmville, feed them, rest, turn south, go to North Carolina. <clears throat> General Grant uh, is pursuing Lee, but he's also got troops who are trying to swing around and block his route to North Carolina and get in front of him. Those who are pursuing or harassing Lee's rear guard every step of the way, and every time that rear guard has to stop and fight, uh, the gap that is developing between the vanguard of Lee's march and the rear guard is getting wider and wider. And finally, in a place called Sailor's Creek near Farmville, uh, Union forces catch Robert E. Lee's rear guard. They hold them there long enough that Union infantry arrives and Union cavalry swings around and cuts that gap and cuts off that rear guard. And that leads to a major battle. And Robert E. Lee lost a fifth of his army in the fighting at Sailor's Creek. Eight, almost 8,000 casualties. Eight generals were captured. One of them is his own son, Custis. So the half of the army that fought at Sailor's Creek, uh, the ones who survived it, they retreated across the high bridge, part of the South Side Railroad. And when they did that, it puts them on the north side of the Appomattox River. And that splits the Lee's army, half on each side of the river. Second critical decision. Lee decides to bring the whole army north of the Appomattox River to the town of Farmville and burn all of the bridges behind him, including the high bridge. But one of the bridges doesn't burn. It's a small wooden wagon bridge down below that high bridge. The Union cavalry got there just in time to put the fire out and save the bridge. So they cross the river right behind Lee. Union infantry is following them. They keep the pressure on Lee. He cannot stop in Farmville. He cannot feed his troops. He cannot rest. Let's keep marching. Heads on into Cumberland County, a place called Cumberland Church. He digs in. Uh, he's attacked on the afternoon of April the 7th. Uh, defends successfully. They don't do him a lot more harm at that point. And then during the night, Robert E. Lee's army slipped away from Cumberland Church, basically undetected by Union forces. They began their third night march in a row, and it's the march that's going to bring them here. Now, when Lee made the decision to go north of the river with his whole army, one of his own generals looked at a map of this area, and he said, we're in a jug. We are trapped between two rivers, the James to our north, the Appomattox to our south. We can't cross either one of them uh, until we get to what he called the neck of the jug. And the neck of the jug is about half mile down that road where this old stage road crosses the Appomattox River. So Robert E. Lee, when he slipped away from Cumberland Church, he marched into Buckingham County, new store. He gets on this old stage road and he proceeds to come this way. Now, General Grant can read a map too. And he understands the situation that Lee is in, and he sees the opportunity that he has. Grant's got three armies, or portions of, at his disposal. Army of the Potomac, mostly infantry. Army of the James, mostly infantry. And then 
Army of the Shenandoah, Phil Sheridan's cavalry, and he divides them up. <coughs> he takes two thirds of the Army of the Potomac, and their orders are wherever Lee goes, you go, you follow him. But he takes the rest of the Potomac and the Army of the James and that infantry, their orders are you march to Appomattox by the highways on the south side of the river, and if you can get to Appomattox in time, uh, we're going to end it at Appomattox. Now, that third army, Sheridan's Cavalry, Sheridan's got spies. They are Union soldiers, but they're dressed like Confederates, and they're in Robert E. Lee's army. And they intercept orders that Lee sent to Lynchburg to have trains with food supplies waiting for him at Appomattox Station. So the orders for the Army of the Shenandoah follow the railroad, capture those trains, and don't let Lee's men get that food. So it is a race. Who's going to get here first? Late in the afternoon of April the 8th, uh, the vanguard of Lee's army begins crossing the river down there at the neck of the jug. They come on up this road through this village. They're heading towards Appomattox Station. They're almost there. And they hear the train whistles blow. The trains are there. The food's waiting for them. The lead group is artillery. It's a hundred cannon that are leading the march. And they begin to pull to the sides of the stage road, opening the road up for a wagon train that follows them to go get the food and bring it back and feed these men who are mostly across the river. They're strung out several miles down past New Hope Church. As the wagons begin to approach Appomattox Station, they hear gunfire. And that's the Army of the Shenandoah. It's, still, it's, it's uh, Custer. Custer was the division of cavalry. got there first. He captured the trains. He denied the food to Lee's men. And then Custer realizes, uh, I'm in front of Robert E. Lee. I've gotten ahead of him. So he sends a probe down that stage road, find out where Lee is, and they immediately run into some of that artillery. 25 guns lined up to the south. And that continues the Battle of Appomattox Station. Tough fight. It's cavalry versus artillery. Horrific wounds for the Union came out of that battle. It took them four attempts to capture those 45 guns. The rest scattered. Some are heading to Lynchburg, some to Oakville. And then Custer's men turned their attention to that wagon train. They started shooting horses and men, tearing up wagons, taking prisoners. And that fight's going to continue on down the road. Uh, they're going to take a thousand men prisoner that night. They're going to destroy 200 wagons and they're going to clog that road with dead animals and torn up wagons. Uh, a portion of that Union cavalry uh, uh, comes riding on down through this village. And they, about 10 o'clock that night, they go riding around that courthouse in pursuit of Confederate Teamsters. And that's when they run into some boys from Alabama, the sharpshooters. They're the leading edge of Robert E. Lee's infantry, and they empty some saddles in that road, and that drives the Union cavalry back. So they go to the top of that ridge, they block the road, they bring in a couple of cannon, they spread out on this ridge over here in the distance, knowing that they cannot hold Robert E. Lee here in a pitch battle, but hoping they can slow him down, delay him long enough that that 20-some thousand, 25,000 Union infantry can get here. So during the night, about 11 o'clock, Robert E. Lee's on that ridge in the distance. He calls his last council of war to consider his options. And now he has three. He can try to fight his way through. He can surrender. <clears throat> or he can obey the orders of Jefferson Davis. And those orders are, do not surrender but disband the army, let them become guerrillas, and let them scatter to the countryside. And Robert E. Lee disobeys that order. He does not believe in guerrilla warfare. Now, surrender is not in his nature. He's going to tell his staff later the next day he would rather die a thousand deaths than go talk to Grant. So when James Longstreet, one of his most trusted generals, says, General Lee, I think there's some fight left on us. Let's see if we can break out of here. That's the decision they make. Now it's 1 o'clock in the morning, April 9th. Robert E. Lee puts on the best uniform he's got. It's brand new. He's never <laughs> worn it. He puts on a ceremonial sword and sash that he's never used. And his aides are curious as to why. And he 
tells them privately, I fully expect to be Grant's prisoner before the day is over. But they've made one, they've made the decision, they're going to make one attempt to open that road and escape. So 2 o'clock in the morning, April the 9th, John Gordon and Fitzhugh Lee. Gordon with infantry, Lee, Fitzhugh Lee with cavalry. They come on up through this village, they go out here to this field behind me where those board fences end and the rail fences start. Two roads come together there, back lane, tip lane. 9,000 Confederate soldiers line up on those two roads. When morning comes, the battle of Appomattox Courthouse is going to begin. And it's still just Union cavalry on top of that hill. But when morning does come, it's foggy, it's misty. Neither side can see the other. They know they're there, but they can't tell what they're facing. And that creates some delay and confusion on the part of the Confederates. Finally, a general out in North Carolina named Grimes says, I'll organize and lead the assault. Uh, but before he can prepare his assault, assault, the Union forces open the battle. They brought in two cannon, and many of those boys have these new repeating rifles, the Spencers and the Henrys. So the amount of firepower that's coming off the top of that hill up there makes it look like it's a lot more men up there than it really is. But the Confederates finally get organized. Grimes leads the assault. It's called a left wheel. It's just like a door swinging on hinges. Far right swings against that Union position. Just cavalry. They sweep them out of the way. They open the road. These boys are <coughs> guarding against cavalry ride men from that direction. They send words back, bring the army on, we can escape. The fighting continues, they're pushing them over the ridge, and then the fog and the mist began to burn off. And they looked into the distance, and one of them would lay to right, he said it looked like a wall of blue coming at us. Army of the James, Army of the Potomac. Union infantry, they marched during the night, they marched much of the night, they covered 30 miles in 24 hours, and they got here in time. And John Gordon knows it's over. He orders his men to withdraw. They come on back down through this village, head to the river. Robert E. Lee calls for a ceasefire, sends out flags of truce, and hoping he can arrange a meeting with Grant. Now early that morning, Lee had ridden to the rear of the lines at New Hope Church, hoping to meet with Grant. He thinks he's coming from that direction with the Army of the Potomac. When Lee arrives at the Union picket lines at New Hope Church, he is told that Grant is no longer coming from that direction. Grant is now heading to Appomattox from that direction. So Lee writes a letter to Grant and says, I am ready to meet with you and discuss the terms of surrender. So Grant's not here yet. They send two copies of that letter it's in two separate directions. One copy intercepts Grant 10 miles from here at Walker's Church. When Grant reads that letter from Lee, he immediately writes a reply, has it sent back to Lee, and, and Grant's letter says, General Lee, I'm going to meet with you just as soon as I can get there. Uh, you pick the place from Lee. So Lee, once he receives Grant's letter, he sends one of his aides, Charles Marshall, on up into this village, find us a place to meet. Marshall rides into the village and he discovers that most of the people are gone. They're hiding or they've left town completely. It's no man's land. So he rides on around the courthouse and starts down the road here and he looks standing in the road in front of that old rainy tavern guest house is the first white man he's seen. And that's Wilbur McLean. So he rides on down to Mr. McLean. He explains he needs a place for the two generals to be. And McLean reluctantly agreed to let him use his home uh, for the people. Marshall's got a young private with him named Joshua Johns. He sends Joshua Johns back to the river to inform Lee that a place has been found and to lead him back. So one o'clock in the afternoon, Joshua Johns, Robert E. Lee, and two Union officers, Babcock and Dunn, come riding up that road around the courthouse. When they get to McLean's gate, uh, Dunn, for the Union, continues on to the top of the hill to let Sheridan know where the meeting will take place. Joshua Johns gathers the horses 
Babcock, Lee, and Marshall go into the parlor and they wait. Now it's about 30 minutes before Grant arrives. On the top of that hill, Sheridan meets him. He tells him, Robert E. Lee is waiting for you in that house. And Grant said, let's go. He came off that hill with about 200 men. Grant, 10 to 15 of his officers go up the steps into the parlor. And an hour and a half later, those two generals have come to terms for the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. Now, when Lee rode in here that afternoon, he was not certain that he would surrender. He came to see what the terms were going to be. And he asked James Longstreet before he left, what terms will Grant give us? Because Longstreet knew Grant. And Longstreet said, General Lee, he's going to treat you the same way that you would treat him if the roles were reversed. But if he doesn't, you break off those talks and you come on back and you tell Grant to do his worst. Well, thank goodness that didn't happen. There are now 95,000 soldiers within five miles of this new village. 30,000 Confederates down at the river, 30,000 Union just to their rear, and 35,000 Union in front. If Robert E. Lee had broken off those talks and Grant had done his worst, thousands of men could have died here. Now, as it was, about 200 did. But as Robert E. Lee read those terms, he realizes how good they are. He's not going to be Grant's prisoner. More importantly to him, none of his officers, none of his men are going to be prisoners of war. Grant's terms say that any Confederate soldier here who will agree to lay down his arms, go home, and not fight anymore until properly exchanged will be paroled. You will not find a civil war anywhere in the world at any time in history that ended like the American Civil War did. Historians say it's Grant's finest hour, the terms he gave Robert E. Lee, and that's true. But it's also Robert E. Lee's finest hour. He accepted the terms. The bloodbath was avoided, but even more importantly, that untold period of lawlessness that would have resulted by turning these boys loose as guerrillas was also avoided. And the man that gets the credit for all of it is Abraham Lincoln. Less than two weeks before Appomattox, Lincoln met with Sherman and Grant down at City Point, and they knew the war was about over. And Lincoln said, gentlemen, can we end this thing without much more bloodshed? And Sherman and Grant both told him probably not. So Lincoln looked at him. He said, you do whatever it takes. But when the time does come, let those boys up easy. Let them surrender. Let them go home and treat them with respect. And that's exactly what Grant did. He wrote the terms. But it was Abraham Lincoln that set the terms. Now, Lee left that meeting around 3 o'clock. He rides back down and crosses the river. And I think you can imagine how emotional that was. As he crossed that river and his men came to him and learned what had taken place. Grant <clears throat> is going to spend one night here. Uh, Lee's going to spend three more nights here. On the morning of <coughs> April the 10th, General Grant rides back down through this village, almost to the river. He encounters Confederate soldiers down there guarding the river crossing. And he requested a second meeting for property Lee. And Lee agreed. Those two generals meet for about 30 minutes that morning on horseback by the side of the road. General Grant looked at General Lee. He said, General Lee, if you'll give the order, there's not a rebel soldier in the South who won't lay down his arms at your command. Will you give the order? And Lee said, no. Uh, not my decision. It's Jeff Davis's decision. The decision of the general is still in the field. And then Lee had a request for Grant. Will you give my men a written parole? Proof they can carry with them on the way home. This man is not a deserter. This man is not a renegade. This man was paroled at Appomattox and told he could go home undisturbed. And Grant said, yes, we'll do that. The ordered printing press is set up in the Clover Hill Tavern. They're going to print about 30,000. 
of those parole slips, 28,231 are issued here at Alphabetics. It's a very valuable piece of paper because in addition, Grant issued orders. That piece of paper is a ticket. That ex-Confederate soldier can ride a train, he can ride a boat, and he can use it to draw rations all the way home. It's very valuable. Now the meeting between Lee and Grant ended. Grant comes on back up through this village. He's going to stop at Wilbur McLean's house. He's going to spend a little time there getting ready for the journey that's going to take him to Washington City where he will meet with Abraham Lincoln on the morning of April the 14th and give him a first-hand account of what took place here. Now as Grant is there preparing to leave, six generals approach that house, three generals from each side. They have been appointed to what's called the Surrender Commission and their orders are plan the official surrender ceremony. <coughs> Grant insisted that there be a ceremony of some type. Two reasons, he wanted to reward his men for what they did. But he wants these boys over here across the river to know they've been beaten, that this is a surrender. This is not a peace treaty. This is not a peace agreement. Uh, he wants them to respect that fact. And so those six generals plan it. Now, it takes three days to accomplish. Uh, the Confederate cavalry surrenders on the 10th and the 11th in the stage road. The artillery surrenders on the 11th down at the river by the sides of the stage road. And then on April the 12th, early in the morning, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain leads almost 6,000 Union soldiers, Army of the Potomac, over that hill and down into this village. They lined the stage road from Wilmer McLean's gate to the courthouse. And from the courthouse all the way down the road past Mr. Pierce's house just over the ridge. Chamberlain takes up position at the head of the two lines on horseback. He's looking over into those Confederate camps. His, uh, his orders are to accept the surrender of Robert E. Lee's infantry. He watches them form up. That first group of Confederate soldiers that comes up the hill that morning are led by John Gordon. And as they enter those two lines of Union soldiers, Chamberlain gives the order, sound the bugle, carry arms. And Gordon recognizes it as a show of respect. He orders his men to return to salute. So Lincoln's desire for respect and dignity, pretty much the way it was done. It took almost seven hours 22,349 Confederate soldiers to march into this village one division at a time. They stacked their rifles in the middle of the stage room, mostly on that side of the courthouse. They left the accoutrements with the rifles. They took the battle flags, rolled them up, the ones they didn't hide, or tear them up, they rolled them up, put them on the rifles. They marched back across the river, they received their parole, and they immediately started walking home. Now, Appomattox is not the end of the war. It's the beginning of the war. And many people will tell you Appomattox is the beginning of the nation that we are today. And if you consider the fact, less than one week after the meeting between Lee and Grant, Abraham Lincoln is dead. All the plans that he'd made to bring this nation back together with malice toward none, all the plans he'd made for four million people who have never been free, all of that is gone. So we wind up with what we call Reconstruction. And if you take the war itself and Reconstruction, it's hard to argue. In many ways, it made us the nation that we are today, for better or for worse. Problems they failed to solve, problems they created. We still deal with many of those same problems to this very day. But there are three things that I want you to remember about Appomattox. Appomattox is the end of the Army of Northern Virginia. They are the premier Confederate Army. Of all of the battlefield casualties suffered by the entire Union Army during the entire Civil War, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia inflicted almost 60% of them. Appomattox is the end of the military career of Robert E. Lee. He is the premier general of the Confederacy. Now, you put those two things together. Appomattox is perhaps the most significant 
Union victory of the entire Civil War. And when it was all said and done, that old stage road brought Lee's army to Appomattox Courthouse. That old stage road accepted the surrender of that army. And that old stage road started those boys home. Now, folks, if you have questions, I'll try to answer them, but if not, I'm going to turn you loose. Yes, sir. What are those stairs for? It's called a style. In that day and time, you didn't build a pasture to keep animals in. You built a fence to keep animals out. That allowed the human beings to go back and forth. They'd have to deal with a gate. But it would keep the animals out. Good question. Anything else? Where's the family cemetery? The Rainey Family Cemetery is right straight across. You can see the, sometimes you can see the monument. I don't know whether you can see it from right here or not. But anyway, the Confederate Cemetery is on top of the hill, and the Rainey Family Cemetery is just okay. directly across the road. Yeah. Big tall stone obelisk. It's not the North Carolina Monument, which is what most people think. Yeah, similar design. Where is the Washington Monument?